Hello and welcome everyone. Good afternoon and happy Earth Day. My name is Desiree and you are joining us here with our beautiful weekly walk series here on Earth Month at April, April 19th of 2023. It's very nice to have you all as we're here, gathered here today to celebrate Earth Month slash Earth Day. Now let us get into it because there is a lot that we have to see. We have architecture, we have wildlife, and we have many different landscapes to talk about. So let's just get into it for today. And of course, we have our Zoom housekeepings where you can give us a question in our Q&A chat feature. And my colleagues, Jose, Carla, and Ryan will be happy to answer any and all questions, again, using the Q&A feature, the chat feature. If you would like to turn off the chat or not see any of the chat previews, all you have to do is press the tiny little arrow by the side of it and then press the check mark so you no longer have to see the chat previews. And of course, we have a live transcript of subtitles that you could also turn off if you press the live transcript button. And of course, we know the Central Park Conservancy's mission is to preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life, the enjoyment and well being of all. And now more than ever, we know how important seeing and viewing nature is as we celebrate this Earth Month. And today for our walk, we are starting in the middle of the park, but if you are trying to complete this walk on your own, I highly recommend you enter from the West 81st Street entrance, but we are starting mid park for today. And we are starting at one of the most beautiful locations to actually see our beautiful Belvedere Castle. Essentially, we're gathered here to talk about Earth Day, which essentially started in 1970 by a Senator Gaylord Nelson. At this time, there were actually no regulations to protect our environment. No Clean Air Act, no Clean Water Act, and et cetera. He made this holiday to showcase issues that were happening to the environment nationally and also globally. But we recognize it nationally here in the US. And Earth Month was also coined in 1970, specifically to bring light to air pollution that was happening in those days. But the technical Earth Day is actually April 22nd, so we are a little bit early, but still happy Earth Day to you all. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about some of the efforts the Conservancy has to combat climate change, some of the things that you can do, and also more fun facts that we're used to, of course. And why did I essentially start here? Essentially, this location specifically showcases us a very different um, various landscapes. We have Belvedere Castle, a showcase of architecture right behind me, which we're about to look at. We have Great Lawn. And right beside Belvedere Castle, we have Ramble, one of our, the Ramble, one of our three famous woodlands. And every single different landscape that you encounter in Central Park has actually different impacts on our environment. So Belvedere Castle is about 150 years old and it was designed by Calvert Vox. But although it's an old building, doesn't necessarily mean it can't be more environmentally friendly. But I'm going to get into that later as we go up to Belvedere Castle. Belvedere also means beautiful view in Italian. And we will get a very beautiful view once we actually make our way up there. But essentially, right behind this spot, right here, is actually the Great Lawn, one of our most notable landscapes in all of Central Park. Different landscapes, as I said, have different impacts on the environment. And although grass can reduce the carbon dioxide that happens in our air, the upkeep and maintenance, maintenance that it's required to actually make these lawns look so beautiful, clean and green, such as they do now, it takes a lot of different resources. Resources that end up farming our environment, like if we use lots of water, so you need lots of water to upkeep these lawns. And essentially, Lawns like this decrease biodiversity. Please tell me the last time you've seen different types of wildlife on these lawns, even birds. They're not usually a huge fan of lawns, so a lot of different other landscapes have a more beneficial impact to the environment 
with different biodiversity and also lots of less upkeep. And also the Conservancy has efforts to actually reduce the use or the upkeep of the lawns as in um, making no mow lawns or low mow lawns. So reducing the amount of time that we actually use that. Also to have soil sensors. So we actually know when the lawn needs water. These are a couple of things that the Conservancy is doing to help the maintenance not be as costly to the earth in our environment. And we do have no mow or low mow lawns in some of our native gardens like Dean Slope and also Wildflower Meadow. But since we were talking about wildlife, on my walk, I have encountered very different many species of wildlife, this one included. What we're looking at right now is the water body turtle pond, and I actually caught a glimpse of a cormorant, most likely a double-breasted cormorant, a medium to large sized aquatic bird that could live in almost any fresh water body. Also a very excellent diver. And essentially, there's large populations of cormorants in North America. There are even populations in Alaska, although they look slightly different. Also, this picture was not taken by me. We have the credits right here on the photo. But essentially, as climate change continues to warm the earth, researchers notice or predict that many bird species are gonna be moving even further up north with evidence of the cormorants moving to places like Greenland for new breeding spots. However, they can't expand their migration journey much further since migration is already so energetically demanding on them. So this is just one of the many impacts climate change actually has on one of the wildlife that we can see here in Central Park. And we're gonna continue our journey. We're gonna saunter up and past looking at our Looking at our beautiful spring blooms, we're going to saunter past the also famous Delacorte Theater. And essentially, the Delacorte Theater was donated by George Delacorte, who also donated other gifts, such as the Delacorte clock that sits right outside of the Central Park Zoo and the Delacorte Memorial, more known as the Alice in Wonderland statue. This is also, of course, the home to Shakespeare in the Park that's actually going to be starting up soon, right at the end of May. This theater is a bit environmentally friendly seeing as it's an outdoor theater. So that means we don't need to use any excess energy on air conditioning or electricity more than necessary. So that's really nice and good. So as we make our way through our weekly walk, we're passing Delacorte Theater and we're about to go up the steps of Belvedere Castle. And we're going up these beautiful steps made out of Manhattan schist up to the castle, but I did notice something on my walk, a beautiful plaque that's situated right beside these steps. And essentially it says, but if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored in sorrow's end. Sonnet 30, and it's in remembrance of Charlotte Jean Johnson. Um, it's very rare that you see plaques um, in the park on rocks, but it is a little bit sustainable since and unlike our benches, you actually don't have to create a whole new structure out of natural materials. And instead you just embed the plate into the rock instead of using any excess materials. So definitely keep your eye out for some plaques on our rocks all over Central Park next time you visit. And we are sauntering our way up the beautiful Belvedere Castle. And I did catch a little glimpse of some spring blooms right beside this little area right before you make it up to Belvedere Castle. We are towards the end of our spring bloom season, and I'll talk a little bit more about as to why. And as we saunter up our steps, hopefully you have some breath left as we walk up here. We have finally made it, and it is a beautiful view indeed. So essentially what we're looking at right now is the restored loggia, which is essentially a open aired structure and this was rebuilt by the Conservancy. So essentially Belvedere Castle came under much disrepair in the 70s and 80s due to vandalism and many other things. It wasn't being upkept properly. But when the Central Park Conservancy started up in the 80s, they made sure to restore Belvedere Castle. And the restoration effort still continues and we also have later ones as well. This was restored in the 2019 restoration. 
And now we have an even more beautiful view of our beautiful Belvedere Castle that's situated on top of Vista Rock. We're looking at Vista Rock, which of course is our beautiful Manhattan schist, the bedrock of Manhattan. And essentially, in that 2019 restoration, they also made this over 150 year old building energy efficient. Essentially, they put a geothermal system which uses the earth's heat to create renewable energy. So although it's such an old building, it still has um, environmental impacts and we have made it environmentally friendly in making it so that it uses this geothermal energy to actually power the building. And although I don't know the specific scientifics that go into this geothermal system, we know that it's an energy efficient building. And if you would actually like to learn more about some of the efforts the Conservancy is doing to combat climate change, how climate change actually impacts Central Park, we have an excellent tour series going on tomorrow and another date, but I'm gonna make sure my colleagues put that information for our climate action tour in the chat so we can further discuss these ma matters of climate change and et cetera. So again, if you're interested in that at all, definitely check the chat for our tours on this subject. Okay, and we're looking at the beautiful plaque of the Belvedere Castle built in 1872, of course, by Calvert Box and restored in 2019, as I talked about earlier. And we are actually getting our final glimpses of the castle before we head off to a completely different landscape. We already saw a lawn, we saw some architecture. Now it's time to go to our woodland. So we're sauntering down the path as we do. And I noticed this very neat sign at the time of tree work ahead. That means that our beautiful Arbor team and operations team means that they're hard at work making sure all of our trees, our flora and fauna are being properly taken care of, of course. So I thought that was a cute sighting as I was on my walk. And here's another very notable sighting. So essentially at one point, this weather station was actually situated in Belvedere Castle. If you've ever heard the term, the weather today is in Central Park, you have this weather station to thank. Essentially, as I was talking about climate change and its long-term effects, this is the weather station that's gonna be recording the temperature in Central Park every single day. As it has been, it started in 1919, it was in Belvedere Castle. In the 1960s, yes, the castle was in disrepair, but once they restored the castle in the 80s and made Belvedere Castle, as we know, a visitor center, they situated this weather station out here, and it's been there to this day. On the subject of climate change, anybody who is a New Yorker, or even if you're not, may have heard of the little heat wave that we had going on last week on Thursday and Friday, where actually record temperatures were set. The record temperatures peaked at 89 degrees, which surpassed the previous record of the highest temperature in April being recorded at 88 degrees in 1977. This is just showing some of the effects of climate change. And it's very weird and strange to have summer weather in April, also during the time where it's supposed to actually have the most rainfall. So we definitely can see these impacts happening as well as last year's summer being recorded as the hottest summer to date. Oh, that's one of the top six hot summers. But we're going to be sauntering down, now that we've seen the castle and all it has to offer, we're going to be sauntering down to the infamous Ramble. All right, so essentially, the temperatures that were recorded last year for summer of 2022 was the sixth hottest summer on record. And the rainfall for the season was actually four inches below average. Again, these are just some of the impacts we can see climate change having on our environment. So definitely, we're going to be thinking about and brainstorming a couple ways that we could actually help those impacts of climate change not be so bad with everybody doing their part, but we'll get into that later. Now, let's just look at the very important rules of the ramble. So essentially, always remember to have your dogs leased at all times in all of our woodlands around Central Park, and that is for your safety and your dog's safety. We are actually gonna encounter some wildlife on this weekly walk. And essentially to keep the safety of you and your dogs, 
Um, there's lots of wildlife in the ramble that we would hate for them to encounter, especially small dogs, because we do have lots of different birds of prey that fly around the ramble at all times. So always keep your dogs leased at, in all woodlands at all times. Stay on the designated paths, again, for your safety. You don't know what wildlife you will encounter. And also walk your bicycle. A lot of these paths are very hilly, very rocky, and some of them aren't even paved. So just leave your bicycle somewhere else or just walk it as you go through any of our woodlands and throughout all through Central Park. All right, so we're gonna be going down the path, but to help you a little bit better navigate the ramble next time you're there, we're going to talk about these lamp light post systems. So essentially, when you see these light posts, the first two numbers indicate the closest cross street that you are at. And the last two numbers indicate if you are on the east or west side. Even if you are on the east side and odd if you're on the west side. So essentially look at the first two numbers, figure out what cross street you're at. Right now it's 78th street. Look at the last two numbers, figure out if it's even or odd. Right now it's odd. So that means we are about west 78th street. So let us continue on our journey as we make it to the nice and beautiful Tupelo Meadow that holds one of our most beautiful, notable trees in all of Central Park. This tree looks like something out of a movie, perhaps, but essentially this a famous black Tupelo tree is dedicated to Elizabeth Barlow Rogers, who was an environmentalist and a former park admin. She actually helped in the restoration efforts of the Conservancy's founding years. One of our great trees in the park, which means that we think that it's a pre-park tree, and one of our most beautiful and grand trees as well. And as we can see in this picture, it's not at bloom yet. So perhaps the next time you visit Central Park, you'll be able to catch this beautiful Tupelo tree in peak bloom. And as we can see, it's characterized by its three large joined trunks, these very intricate branch systems. And it's also a subfamily of the dogwoods. So definitely check out Tupelo Meadow and this very famous black Tupelo tree next time you're in Central Park. So we're gonna saunter on the side beside Tupelo Meadow until we get, so that's approximately where we're at right now, this little dude right here, until we get to this little clearing that actually leads us to a path. Although it doesn't look like it, if you walk straight across here, and get to our fences, we are going to encounter yet another path. All right, so as I was actually on my walk here, I definitely heard some water, a little babbling brook or a stream perhaps, and this is just to help orient us on where we are. We are now at West 77th Street, 77th across street, 67th, we know that is odd, so that means we are approximately at West 77th Street, I wanted to actually locate this body of water that I was hearing on my walk, so I did. And we finally make it to what's known as Azalea Pond. Looking very nice and beautiful on one side and just as beautiful on the other side where you could actually see the azalea plants that the pond is actually named after. This looks like a very natural stream, but we do know that Central Park is human made and the ramble specifically was made in the vision of Olmsted and Vox's vision. They wanted to mimic um, the Catskills Mountains. So when you're walking around the Ramble, you're supposed to feel like you're hiking around the Catskills. These azalea plants are actually over a hundred years old and they still bloom in the summer. So next time you visit the Ramble, definitely check out Azalea Pond. And of course, we know that we always love to follow directions and follow all the signs in our parks so for a reason, they're for your safety. No dogs are allowed in any body of water in Central Park. We would hate for any dogs to get sick from an algae bloom, et cetera. So no dogs allowed in any body of water in Central Park. All right, so we're gonna continue on our journey through the ramble. We're not gonna get lost because we have a map, so it's okay. We just left Azalea Pond, which is around the Gill area. And we are going to continue on our journey, looking at some more beautiful Azalea bushes. But, excuse me, but what is that that I see slash here in the tree right up above me? 
So I had a very awesome chance sighting on my birding adventures of this beautiful red-tailed hawk, what I believe to be a red-tailed hawk. These are one of the native birds here. So although it is bird migration season, this bird is native here, one of the birds of prey that I was actually talking about earlier. They are the most common bird of prey in all of North America. And they have various color variations from white feathers to nearly all black feathers. And they often can be seen perched on branches or poles, searching and scanning for their next meal, their next prey. And now we have a little bit of a better look. Again, this is not my picture. Credits are on the screen. But essentially, um, fun fact about the red-toiled hawk, its signature scree or cry is used as a sound effect in many different movies and TV shows for any type of bird of prey. So if you've seen an eagle or something like that in a movie and you've heard that signature cry, it actually comes from the red-tailed hawk. Some of these red-tailed hawks in different areas are migratory. However, they thrive most in colder areas. However, since the 90s, temperatures have risen approximately 1.8 Fahrenheit per the mean average temperature that we usually have. And studies are showing a trend of less hawk sightings as the average temperature rises. So this is just another example of how climate change is actually impacting our environment as well as the wildlife in there. Also to note, never ever feed any of the wildlife in Central Park. They have everything they absolutely could ever need. Throughout our various flora and fauna and other wildlife, like this bird might actually prey on, in Central Park, so just never ever feed our wildlife. You're actually doing a detriment to them and you can make them sick. All right, so we're gonna continue actually to our last stop of our beautiful walk. And we're going to a very popular and notable spot in the Ramble, especially for the birding community. So right now we are currently at the Avodia feeders that are set up by the Audubon Society actually one of the oldest organizations in the world. So shout out to the Audubon Society. So the Audubon Society is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the conservation of birds and their habitats. Oh my goodness. They only fill up the feeders in the winter because that is the time, essentially, the only time that the birds might need some extra help when it comes to feeding. But even though that's the time that they have slightly less food than normal, there's still no reason to actually feed the, feed the wildlife in any of Central Park. They all got it. And also organizations like the Audubon Society has it to properly feed and care for the birds whenever they need from all the plants. So as I was waiting so patiently for something to finally appear, oh boy, oh boy, something actually did. So what seems to have appeared is a downy woodpecker. Um, Downy is referring to their soft white feathers or their long white back stripe that they're characterized by having. And they often get confused with hairy woodpeckers with similar markings, but their feathers have a more hair-like consistency. They also even have special feathers around their nostrils to make sure that they don't breathe in any wood or bark. And here we have a much closer up picture of a downy woodpecker. So fun fact, downy woodpeckers are the most likely out of all woodpecker species to actually visit a bird feeder. They have extremely dainty, tiny beaks, as we can see here, and separating them, that's what separates them from some other woodpecker species, they're very dainty beaks. They are a symbol of bravery and also hard work. And also their brain is protected by a spongy like shock pad. That's like an elastic type material that's basically between their bill and their skull to make sure that they don't absorb any of that shock they may have as they're peck, peck, pecking away at any type of wood or tree that they actually may encounter. So that was very special and nice indeed. I'm a new birder, but I always get so excited to see different types of birds all throughout Central Park. So definitely check out the Avodia feeders the next time you are in Central Park and you enjoy birding, especially. All right, so we are wrapping up our walk for today. Essentially, um, we are 
passing through this area. So the avodia feeders are around that area. And we're making our way down the path and all that. And just to orient ourselves, we're about here. So about 77th on the east side. So around East 77th. And we're just making our way to our last stop of the day. I got a little glimpse at some beautifully leashed dogs as they should be, as they always should be in all of our woodlands throughout Central Park. And um, this last place, the Ramble Shed is closest to 78th on the east side, 78th east side. So that about wraps up our weekly walk for this week. However, um, at these beautiful bathrooms of the Ramble Shed, one of the last things the Conservancy is doing to help the earth and combat climate change is by having an electric fleet of vehicles. So we are phasing out all of our gas powered vehicles in exchange for some electric powered vehicles like this one you see right here. I'm also realizing um, we also have to wrap it up finally our tour, which we're going to put in the chat right now. Okay, so please, please come out. If you liked our conversation about our about climate change and you want to find out more of the Conservancy's efforts to combat climate change and become sustainable, definitely come to these showings, these viewings of the Climate Action Tour. We have a lot of spots left and we would love to have you. It's in, it's in partnership with the Climate Lab that we have at the Central Park Conservancy. And again, if you would like more information on that, you can always check out our site, centralparknyc.org. But definitely thank you for continuing to support the Conservancy. Thank you for your love of nature and the love of parks in general. I hope all of you stay safe and be well. And bye-bye for now. Thank you for coming.